Ah, yes. This half of the island, this Papua New Guinea, it's an independent state after 1975. Uh, before the northern part was German colony, the southern part was British colony. Uh, previous to independence, both territories were Australian colony and uh, there are the different provinces. So, the first uh, encounter of the inhabitants was only with the outside the world, uh, happened uh, in the end of last cent of, of, of 19th century and the I interior only was uh, discovered by Europeans in the early eight, uh, 19th century, <coughs> no, 20th century, uh, around First World War. And they were only in the coastal areas. And then in the 50s, they started to find out about the interior. And so the first encounters of uh, local people were starting at this time. And I went there in the, exactly in 1970. And there were still some tribes uh, literally in Stone Age. They had Stone Age <coughs> technology and some of them didn't even know or have experienced uh, steel tools like bush knife and so on. They were very keen to get this. So this is Western Highlands. This is here, Southern Highlands, Western Highlands, Enga and Chimbu. These are the provinces where I did most of my research. And here we are in detail. So the, the main area here is called the Wagi Plain, the Wagi Basin. And here archaeological work started in the 60s by my mentor Professor Bulma and then in the 70s there was a lot of swamp dwelling excavations and they found out the, the first traces of uh, plant domestication which happened 9,000 years ago. So that's what the area looks like. This is above, uh, uh, maybe 1,800 meter. That's the average level of the highlands areas. And above there are mountain ranges up to 6,000 meters. You see them in a the distance. Some of them have a white cover because of this altitude. So, now let's talk about the shaman. Uh, in literature about uh, Melanesian traditions, the the term shaman was uh, rather replaced by the term ritual expert because I could label my topic with the phrase 50 shades of shamanism <laughs> because there are intricate patterns of social organization of all these tribal communities. There is They are uh, living in different hamlets, nearly one hem uh, fairly one hamlet belonged to one 
Chen, and there are clusters of hamlets belonging to related clans, and more clans will be a tribal unit. And then there are several tribes be making up a, a, a larger community. So every local group, not all of them all uh, have a shaman of their own or, or a retail expert, but some of them, more of them, they share one, perhaps. But not all of them are equal and they have the same functions and so on and so on. Because there is a division between uh, the local ritual community. These are the everyday occasions when the ritual is uh, needed for some purpose. And there are intertribal uh, ritual communities which are secret spirit cults. This is like in our civilization if you are a member of the Freemasons or something. So the members of the spirit cults, they have a special uh, position among the others because they know more. They are more acquainted with spiritual powers and so on. And mostly shamans belong to this group. And there are several uh, ritual communities of this kind because belonging to different spirits with special characters. Now this one is a ritual expert. They usually invite spiritual <coughs> experts on special occasions when they have a, a big ritual like big killing or uh, ceremonial exchange events. Then for special needs they invite a ritual <coughs> expert who knows about this kind of ritual or he knows some uh, special spells. So he always is also paid because he doesn't do it for nothing. Also in case of initiations, they invite specialists to have a good performance of the initiation. And there are other ones who are more than ritual experts. They are what we could say magicians. And they possess all sorts of secrets how to influence all sorts of things. It's all a matter of getting educated in the right way there because not all of the community members are have the same access to all the tribal secrets. It depends on the degree of the initiation. Now, this is one ritual uh, during initiation. These people are not vomiting down below, they vomiting up because they drink a very special uh, juice mixed with water and then the whole uh, intestines will get out and they get cleansed uh, from influences which they regard bad influences. As in the case of if you get adult, you must get rid of all the remnants of your mother's milk which you drank as a baby. If you want to be a right man, you must get rid of this. So they have all these cleansing rituals. <coughs> 
Yes, I talk about the ceremonial exchange festivals. One item which they like to exchange is this kind of pearl shells. They are mounted in a special way and painted with red ochre, which plays a great role in all other rituals, rituals too. Red ochre is a very important item representing blood and energy. And uh, also they have peak exchange festivals. This is just small part of the whole uh, festival site. There are so many peaks lined up at this occasion. And then they all get slaughtered at the same time and cooked at the same time and eaten up at the same time until next festival which will take place perhaps in seven years time because they have killed all their pigs and they must wait to rise more than again but it is like this they invite <coughs> a neighboring tribe who will feast on this and then the invited tribes will invite the host tribe for the next time and so this is the exchange and they are always proud to uh, have more pigs offered than the other tribe this is a competition you see the detail of these uh, shells uh, the name of the shell is Kina, by the way, and the currency in New Guinea now is also Kina. Because this was used as a currency before too. Bright price, for example, if a young man wanted to convince his father-in-law, he had to offer him so many Kina shells or so many pigs and so on. Now the Kina shells are lined up. This is also a, a part of the ritual, exchange ritual. What you see here is this man wearing a, an interesting headdress. This is a wig. And wigs are very important. And they are constructed during the rituals. There is a ritual cycle when the boy grows up and he grows more hair and beard and gets a adult, he, he must go to some kind of, yes, it's, it's week school. They go, this is in, during the initiation and there is the week master and he's a ritual expert. He knows a lot of uh, spells, how to grow a lot of hair and get a lot of energy and so on. You see here, they use special herbs to improve the growing of hair. And they are very excited about it because it's an important feature. He, here, this is another stage of the ritual. If the, the wig is big enough, the, the hair is cut off and then it is a, some more items are added and finally the, the the wig is ready you see during growing hair the man must sleep like this with the neck rest uh, in order to don't disturb the, the hair growing and in some cases uh, they suffer from a continual drop of water going down to their eyes, like is known from Chinese torture. This is a brainwashing uh, method. And this, the, the, the reason for this is also to get visions during initiation. And there is another cleansing ritual. 
they use vines, flexible vines, uh, and they pull them, push them down into their stomach, and uh, to show who is has most endurance. And sometimes they, yes, they, they even produce blood coming out. This is also a cleansing uh, ritual. Yes, in the way with the woman thing. They do the same thing with the nose too. They induce nose bleeding for the same reason. And this is scarification. This is not the uh, custom in the highlands. This is custom of the River Sepik area. But there they have very famous uh, incision tattoos to make them look like uh, crocodile skin. Because crocodile is their spiritual ancestor. And here we have a very famous place. Here the first excavation took place of a rock shelter. And here it could be proved the transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And various degrees of, of tool technology improvement. And this is still used for rituals, but it's also used for as a tourist attraction. Only during the rituals, tourists are have to keep out. Yes. Now, there is a big cultural change in the meantime. 50 years ago, when I was there, uh, there were missionaries already there, but locals, the, some listened to them, some not, some obeyed what they said, some not. It was up to everyone how he wanted to deal with this. Now in the meantime there are at least one congregation for if there are 50 people they have one uh, congregation already with a special name. Before there were Lutherans and Catholics only, then Adventists came, then uh, Baptists came and then all sorts of other ones. And now they invent a new congregation nearly every month because local uh, authorities want to be spiritual leaders and so they need some congregation and they build up another church again and then they are spiritual leaders of their community. And this all replaced the role of shamans. Most shamans after this had to hide away because they were not important anymore. Also many rituals ceased, they were not important anymore. They still do peak exchange or shell exchange but only as a kind of folkloristic event. There is, there is no spiritual meaning behind it anymore. But there are still rituals held. Even the, the old uh, spirit cults are still performed, but secretly, because their followers must take care very much of the enthusiastic Christian people. Otherwise, they are accused of doing pagan rites or witch work or something like this. And now instead of shamans, there are so-called glassmen, 
This means they can look through everything and they find out who, per, which person is a witch or is not correct. So he is accused and tortured and finally must die in the fire. And these events, they take place nearly every week in another village. This is like football match to watch for the public. And that's the progress in the new spiritual world now. And that's actually happened. Uh, this woman is uh, known. You see the tire. First she was tortured, then the tire will be set on fire and she will die. And people will applaud. And now, two weeks ago, I got news. The daughter of this woman, aged six, was also caught and tortured. But uh, luckily enough, it was rescued in the last moment. <coughs> so this went through the press and even the prime minister uh, said something about it. So, I hope this is uh, enough for now, and later you can ask questions.